вот сегодня у нас как раз такой so неожиданный From the point of conflict studies, what is it? It is a conflict on a very large scale. When representatives of employees, and how were the employees represented? The employees were represented in the Soviets, councils, entered a conflict with representatives of the employee. Soviets are assemblies elected by and from an industrial plant. What was the name of the representative of the employer? The Russian Provisional Government. They deposed that provisional government, that representative of the employers, since the government did not in any way satisfy the demands of the workers. It reintroduced capital punishment, it did not grant land to the peasants, factories and industry on the whole was in dire straits. And this power was passed on to whom? To an even wider representational body of the employees, namely the second All-Russian Congress of Workers and Soldiers Deputies Soviets. What sort of transfer of power was it? Peaceful or not peaceful? To sum up, a large-scale conflict took place. The conflict had existed for a long time. It was the conflict between the bourgeois government and the working class, a more progressive class. In other words, it was a conflict between two classes, the working class, which expresses interests of all working people, and is the most progressive power of the modern era, and the bourgeoisie, which in its time was also a progressive class. Was it? It was. And it performed brilliant bourgeois revolutions, which freed people from serfdom. It is so, and it is not for nothing that the French Revolution of 1789 is called the Great French Revolution. It is even strange that some of our comrades, including our former governor of St. Petersburg, don't respect the creators of the bourgeois revolution as they should be respected. In Russia, we are now experiencing bourgeois counter-revolution, and so it is logical to respect the representatives of bourgeoisie, the revolutionaries. We had Marat Street, named so after a bourgeois revolutionary Jean-Paul Marat. He was a very progressive bourgeois revolutionary. We also had Robespierre embankment. However, based on the fact that on this embankment there used to be a church of resurrection, comrade governor went and removed the name of Robespierre. It is now resurrection embankment. Who cares now that there was a, such a church there at one time? It is a little bit strange that bourgeois personalities, since they have now come to power, they must respect in some way their founding fathers, those who stood at the origins of the bourgeois revolutions. Is that not so? Otherwise, it is strange. Moreover, the Russian state is going to mark in one way or another the centenary of the Great October Socialist Revolution. Today, on the 7th of November, there was a whole page in the Rossiyskaya Gazeta, Russia's Gazet, devoted to the proposal to write Lenin's new biography. One should keep in mind that there are 50 volumes of Lenin's works, and there are also 40 Lenin's compilations, plus there are over 13 volumes which are called biographical compilations. They contain detailed accounts of what Lenin did minute by minute. At this time, when the bourgeois authorities demonstrate this sort of respect towards the creators of the proletarian revolution, at the same time the bourgeois authorities or their individual representatives show disrespect toward the representatives of the bourgeoisie. What was the conflict of the proletarian revolution? The conflict was over significant problems. The issue of the First World War, because the working class and other working people demanded to stop the war. The working people of other countries involved in the war demanded the same thing. No other country but Russia succeeded in driving the state onto the path of ending the war. The only state that stopped that slaughter, the First World War, was the Soviet state. The next issue was that of land. It is known that the Bolsheviks' manifesto was different from that of the socialist revolutionaries. What was the Bolsheviks' manifesto? The Bolsheviks did not intend to divide the land among the peasants, but they wanted to combine it so that all land belonged to everybody and to establish cooperative labor on this land. Conversely, the peasants' demand was to take the land off the land aristocracy and to divide it up. The Bolsheviks agreed to satisfy this demand in order to keep peace with the peasantry. 
One should not start a conflict with the peasantry in a peasant's country, is that not so? So the land was divided up according to the number of eaters in each peasant family, as per the peasants' demands. This is why, when Denikin started his attempts to overthrow the Soviet power, he failed. He marched along, taking the land off the peasants and returning it to the land aristocracy. He hanged the peasants, which had started to cultivate their land. And as he was approaching Moscow, when it seemed as if the days of the Soviet power were numbered, at this very moment the peasants rebelled against Denikin. Those peasants who had been drafted into Denikin's army started fighting worse, and the peasants who fought against Denikin in the Red Army started fighting very well. As a result, Denikin was pushed to the south, all the way to the sea, where eventually they boarded the ships and immigrated. This is how the Russian Civil War ended. So, we can see that the scale of the conflict was colossal. However, the very act of the revolution was entirely bloodless. What was the situation here in Petrograd, St. Petersburg, in 1917, from the point of view of conflict studies? Two classes found themselves in a conflict. On the one side, the bourgeoisie, which had only recently received state power in February 1917, is that not so? Since February, it has been what? February, March, April, May, June, July, August, September, October, just eight months. Over these eight months, what has the Russian provisional government achieved? It promised to convene the All-Russian Constituent Assembly, but it did not. It promised to satisfy the hopes of the people concerning the end of war, but it did not. It introduced capital punishment on the front. Having done this, the government did not only worsen the situation at the front for the people, but also its own future. Furthermore, on its own, the Russian provisional government could not deal with General Kornilov's affair when he moved his forces against the bourgeois government and against the revolution. Who helped the provisional government subdue the Kornilov Putsch, the Bolsheviks? After Kornilov's affair, the Bolsheviks got majority in the following Soviets. The Soviets' councils of the armed forces on the Northern Front, in Moscow, and Petrograd's Soviets. The ensuing situation was it as follows. Who now could enter a conflict with whom and in what way? Who could start a conflict with representatives of the working class in Petrograd? No one could. Since in Petrograd the troops supported the Bolsheviks, no one could start a fight with the armed forces in Petrograd. The women's battalion, surely, could not wage a war against the Petrograd garrison. Members of the Constitutional Democratic Party, cadets, junior officers, yunkers, who were young future warriors, also could not fight with Petrograd garrison, so there could have been no battle. In addition to that, there were the Red Guards. In the pictures, they are always depicted riding lorries. However, they are never depicted shooting at anyone. Whom would they shoot? There was no one opposing them. The whole question was, from this point of view, it was a conflict of a very large scale. The larger scale is only wars, some of them. How was this conflict resolved without violence? Very simply. One had to make sure that the nation did not have an impression that some small group of people captured power in the country, because had it been so, it would have led to a large conflict. Consequently, Lenin's advice was not to take the power before the Second All-Russian Congress of Workers' and Soldiers' Deputies Soviets, because had the Petrograd Soviet taken the power in Petrograd, it would have been accused of usurping the power. It would have looked as if the Petrograd Soviet had dared act as if it were representing the whole of Russia. This would have meant setting all Russia to attack the Petrograd Soviet. This would have not done. Alternatively, the taking of the power might have happened too late, after the Second All-Russian Congress of Workers' and Soldiers' Deputies Soviets. The Congress might have held a session here in the Smolny, it could have criticized the provisional government, there could have been a lot of talking and no decisions made. The Congress could have failed to adopt any documents and might have ended the session. And it was not certain when the next Congress of the Soviets would happen, if ever. 
And then the Petrograd Soviet could have taken the power a day after the Congress finished its session. It would have looked as if the Petrograd Soviet acted on its own authority, without ratification of the Congress. Again, it would have been the same as putting the Petrograd Soviet under attack from the rest of Russia. Thus, the only correct conflictless way was the following – to take the power in the morning and to pass it in the evening to the second All-Russian Congress of Workers' and Soldiers' Deputies Soviets. And the Congress then ratified the government's role, the Council of People's Commissars, or Sovnarkom, headed by Lenin. And this was it. On this very day, All-Russian government arose. And who was against that government of all the Soviets, all Russia? Whoever was, was against it rose against the Soviet power. And so, if someone wanted to start a war, they would have had to face the Soviets. Moreover, consider the position of our military. Krasnov promised Lenin not to fight against the new power. Krasnov was let go based on his officer's word. He went to the River of Don and immediately started to gather the White Guards. He broke his officer's word. In this situation, the Soviet government was forced to gather the Red Guards in response. And then both sides realized that just the Guards were not enough. And there was a need for military draft. Both the Whites and the Reds decided on the draft. You must have an impression of a draft. Imagine, you are two neighboring villages. This is one village and that is another. A crew of the Whites has entered your village. They are asking you, are you going to join the White Army? You are. And why is this one silent? Take her, please, out to the corridor. And uh, all we will hear is a shot and it's done. They are carrying her away. Did you want to join as well? It is too late now. Now, the Red Army have come to your village. So how is it? Are you joining the Red Army? They have. Everybody has joined the Red Army. Who comprised the majority in the Red Army? The peasants. Who comprised the majority in the White Army? The peasants. This is why the whole question of the civil war was, some people ask, who won? Who won? The army that won was the one that protected the pressing interests of the peasantry. Because one army of barefoot men dressed in rags protected the peasants' interests, i.e. to divide up the land according to the number of family members. And this is what was done. And the other army wanted to take this land off the peasants and to return it to the land aristocracy. And so they lost. A student inquires. So, according to your words, the ones who won did not represent the interests of the peasants, but rather had better PR. Professor Popov. The best PR is to express the people's interests. I always have your PR. I want to express your interests, so, so this is my PR. And the PR that amounts to deception, that only pretends to have your interests in mind, but in the actual fact only thinks about how to fill up their own purse, that is the PR that you meant. Did the Soviet government give the land to the peasants, or was it just PR? Student replies. The peasants were already holding the land. Professor Popov. No, dear comrade, not until the decree on land. After the decree on land, all local Soviets, which were, by the way, not all Bolshevik, there were Menshevik Soviets as well, and the Soviets initially were not Bolshevik. This is why there is no PR here at all. A student comments. At the stage of securing population for your cause, it is not important if the promise will be carried out or not, because you can get the population on your side for the current moment, so that they act in the way you want them to at this very moment. Professor Popov. This is a mode of action of people who do not think about long-term interests. A student comments. Seriously? Peasants think about their long-term interests? Professor Popov. No, the Soviet government thought how to ensure the peasants' long-term interests, and it did. The Soviet government also thought about workers' long-term interests when it gave factories to the workers. The decree on workers' control was the first one, immediately. 
The Bolsheviks also convened the All-Russian Constituent Assembly, which other parties failed to do despite the fact that they had had representatives in the government and no one stood in their way. Why did cadets, social revolutionaries or Mensheviks not convene the All-Russian Constituent Assembly? What prevented them from doing so? They did not want to. They would have had the most effective PR if they had. Everybody was in favor of the All-Russian Constituent Assembly, but it was only the Bolsheviks who actually convened the All-Russian Constituent Assembly in January 1918. And surely there was an effective piece of PR when the Russian provisional government asked the Bolsheviks to fight Kornilov. The Bolsheviks obliged. This was in part PR. However, it turned out that it was precisely the Bolsheviks who helped. And the Bolsheviks' influence over public opinion had greatly increased because the Red Guards turned up and the sailors of the cruiser Aurora guarded the Winter Palace. This is why the revolutionary forces did not need to run to storm the Winter Palace, as you can see in cinema, to arrest the provisional government. They simply entered the palace by a side door, through the entrance they knew, and arrested the Russian provisional government. Everything was quiet and peaceful. And that was it. The most peaceful revolution was the Great October Socialist Revolution. It is a different matter that any great revolution and an attempt to resolve peacefully that sort of conflict does not happen in most cases without a civil war. Why? Because the obsolete class does not want to give up their centuries-old privileges without multiple attempts to return them. They would like to win back, to return the land, to return the factories and mills. The obsolete class would not give those up without a fight. This is why in this case a civil war is a possibility. And Lenin wrote thus, A peaceful revolution is possible in some small country, when in a nearby large country a socialist revolution has won, and the bourgeoisie of the smaller country is afraid for their heads. Here is an example of a peaceful revolution for you, the one in Czechoslovakia. Do you know how it happened? Czechoslovakia's bourgeois government, when our troops were stationed there after World War II, or as we call it the Great Patriotic War, the bourgeois members of the government intended to bring down their government. In it, the chairman of the government was a communist, and so was the minister of defense and the minister of security. The bourgeois members wanted to leave the government, thinking that by all bourgeois laws, the government would be rendered invalid and that it would be dissolved. All of them had left, but the three communists who were in the government declared that they would not leave. And they called on the workers' militia, together with the military and the security forces, to go out in the streets. The workers' militia is this. In Czechoslovakia, each worker had his own rifle in his locker at the factory. And the workers took these rifles, got out in the streets, walked around for a bit in 1948, and after this walk, bourgeois parties did not re-enter the government. This is how a socialist revolution occurred in Czechoslovakia. Another consideration, of course, is that the Soviet Red Army was present there as well, and they would have not allowed any slaughter there. That is it. This is a peaceful revolution. Peaceful revolutions are possible. Unarmed revolutions are not.